Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. Our top story this hour, Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari has told the Senate that a new board for the Niger Delta Development Commission will be recomposed for confirmation. In a letter to the Senate, Buhari says the board appointment confirmed by the Senate has been put on hold to allow for an uninterrupted forensic audit of the NDDC. A new board of the commission was screened by the Senate on October 2019, but is yet to be inaugurated by the president, a situation that has raised questions from stakeholders and groups in the Niger Delta area. While the process of composition and Senate confirmation of the appointment of the board was ongoing, I had directed that the forensic audit of the commission be carried out, which is being overseen by the constituted interim management team. Based on this and in order to allow for an interrupted process of the forensic investigation, the board appointment confirmed by the Senate has to be put on hold to allow the interim team continue to manage the commission pending the outcome of the forensic audit. Thereafter, a new board of the commission will be recomposed for confirmation by the Senate. So it appears that God's will has prevailed. Get it? God's will have prevailed. Um, That's a good board. one. I mean, I had to. You had to. I had to. So this is apparently what the um, President Buhari has decided to do, because there was a lot of back and forth. We had guests on this show arguing for the position or the validity of the interim board over the Senate confirmed board, and the President has now weighed in on one particular side. So it appears that that exercise by the Senate in October of last year was an exercise in what futility because another it's been put on hold. But the letter doesn't say it's been put on hold pending the determination of this um, audit. It says it has been put on hold, but a board will be recomposed. So it's actually not been put on hold at all. It's been scrapped. Yeah. Well, technically, the uh, president has dissolved the sixteen-member board yes. mm -hmm. uh, led by uh, Dr. Odubu uh, as chairman and uh, Bernard Okumaba as managing director, and 13 others. Out of the 16, one person did not present, did not appear for the screening, and that's Joy Nune, uh, who is now uh, the head of the interim management team that was set up. Mm. So technically, you know, that uh, exercise has been nullified, and that's why the president in his letter now says that he will send another list of the board for the consideration of the uh, Senate. But I think that what we should worry about, truly, is the confusion uh, that has developed around the uh, composition of the NDDC board. You will recall that the Senate itself, uh, speaking through Senator Enyenaya Baribe and Senator Ike Ekuremadu, had opposed the uh, appointment of an interim management board. And their argument uh, last year, specifically in December, because that uh, original board was mm. uh, approved by the Senate on December 5, 2019. The argument was that, look, it is illegal to set up an interim management board. That the Senate, having confirmed the list of uh, members for a new board, had already done its part, and that the interim management team should be asked to step down. Because the enabling act of the NDDC, in their view, you know, does not uh, recognize the existence of an interim management board. Uh, but the uh, president then said, no, we want to do a forensic audit of the NDDC. And then there was another argument over whether it should be the interim management team that should do that audit or a new board, you know, that is just coming in yeah. afresh. But in the view of the president, he wants the interim management team uh, to do the audit. And again, the governors also disagreed over the composition of the board mm. that was announced at the time. Uh, over the distribution of positions and whether or not the chairman and the uh, managing director, you know, came from the uh, uh, appropriate states on the basis of uh, a rotational principle that the governors were insisting upon. And then, of course, the other controversy is the persecution of the interim management team with people speculating, some interested stakeholders, uh, that Joinuri has a fake NYSE certificate. And, and then all that talk about contracts and all of that. So in the midst of all of that, uh, what we have seen is confusion. What we have seen is the politicization of a strategic body, such as the NDDC. And what we have also seen is, uh, you know, delay in terms of productivity 
I mean, the NDGC uh, interim management team failed to present, you know, his budget estimates for more than uh, five or six weeks mm. because they were distracted. And I think that, you know, this should be resolved quickly. Uh, the president, having said he has now dissolved uh, the uh, original board, should give, uh, you know, instructions as to a quick completion of the forensic audit and the appointment of a new board uh, so that, you know, NDDC can move forward. It's an embattled body, uh, but the situation is even worse now. Uh, the emphasis here is no longer on development or productivity. The emphasis is on, on uh, intrigue, mischief, yeah. politics. And I don't think that that would be in the best interest of the uh, people of the uh, Niger Delta oil producing uh, areas. Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head and it's such a shame because it's the people here that are suffering with everything, all the, the entire politicization of the NDDC. And it's clear the president has scrapped that board. So all that jargon that was used by them is not even, it's not even worth going into. It's clear that the board has been scrapped and he's putting a new board in. But the main issue here is the development of the Niger Delta. And that's what people need to be concerned about. Things need to move quickly. This forensic audit needs to hurry up because at the end of the day, that it's, the NDDC was created for a reason. And that reason actually, it, it needs to be put into action now. Too much is going on with this. This has been politicized for so long. Think about the amount of guests that we had coming on the show to discuss and give several yeah. different angles to this story. Let's just hope that now this actually comes to an end. Put the board in, finish the forensic audits, and please let's move on with the development of the Niger Delta. That's the most important thing here. And I'm willing to bet you good money that we're going mm. to have even more guests. Yeah, as the story develops, <laughs> because we haven't heard the end of it. Yeah. But in any case, uh, don't expect any kind of conflict between the Senate and the presidency. Oh, no. oh, absolutely oh, not. No, no, no. I'm allowed to <laughs> may have, uh, may have complaint, <laughs> but you know his position as Senate president. Mm. He says anything the president brings to the Senate will be supported. Because anything the president wants is in the national interest. I see this gesture here. <laughs> it's not an accident, is it? <laughs> Dr. Masi, still in Nigeria, the federal government has said it will not be distracted by the rating of Transparency International, which ranks Nigeria low in its latest International Corruption Perception Index, CPI. It also said it is not fighting corruption to impress any organization, including Transparency International, TI. The Minister of Information and Culture, Al Haji Lai Mohammed, gave the government's position in London when he featured on interview sessions with some international media organizations. Reacting to the TI rating, the minister described as incorrect the position by the organization that Nigeria was doing worse in fighting corruption, saying that the government is unhappy about the development. Meanwhile, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Mr. Abubakar Malami, said there was nothing that had not been done as a nation in the fight against corruption. Well, we've discussed this before, and I do sympathize. It is discouraging that when you feel you've made your very best efforts, mm. you get this report card and you get like a D minus or 26 <laughs> out of 100, 26 percent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really most discouraging. But I think the proper thing to do is to use it as fuel yeah. to further the drive and to actually take the criticisms on board, the definition employed by TI is broader than the one the federal government is thinking of, exactly. which is the prosecution and the conviction of corrupt public mm -hmm. officials. They are going into the rule of law. They are going into political corruption. And all of these are glaring facts. These are facts. They Elections cannot be disputed. Included. Yes. So I think the thing to do is to actually broaden the fight against corruption and deepen it. Mm -hmm. Well, quick comment. I mean, it's interesting that Alaji Lai Mohammed is uh, defending the government. We all know that the default position of the government, anytime there is any assessment that appears negative, either from the Bretton Woods institutions or yeah. any other body, uh, is to reject that assessment. Mm -hmm. But you will recall, in 2012, when Nigeria received a similar rating from uh, Transparency International, that year Nigeria was 35, was rated 35 uh, corrupt nation. This time is rated 34. This same Allah Jilai Mohammed condemned the Jonathan administration. There we you go. Dr. Abati with the receipts. <laughs> he bought receipts. All the let's, tea. Let's take a quick break. Now we'll be back with more on the news headlines. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. Well, to know, you know, and uh, Leila, before we went on break, I was saying that 
what has happened in terms of Alaji Lai Mohammed's uh, reaction to Transparency International is quite ironic because in 2012, when Transparency Inter International rated Nigeria in the same manner, um, Nigeria then was rated the 35th you know, most corrupt nation in the world. Now, this year, uh, Transparency International says Nigeria is uh, the 34th most corrupt uh, nation uh, in the world. And now, Alaji Lai Mohammed, having moved from being the spokesperson of the uh, All Progressives uh, Congress uh, during that period in 2012, and now as Minister of Information, is attacking the same Transparency International under similar circumstances that he praised to high heavens in, uh, you know, uh, 2012. At the time, he had said President Jonathan was not serious about uh, fighting corruption, and he had admonished the uh, administration. But here he is, a spokesman for government, uh, now turning around 360 degrees. Quite ironic, isn't it? Quite. Extremely ironic. And one of those life's vagaries. I'm mm -hmm. sure you are particularly tickled by this <laughs> <laughs> situation, yeah, I, honestly. Well, maybe to be, to be charitable. We play different kinds of rules at different times. Absolutely. <laughs> and now we'll head over to Aaron Akarajala, who's here to give us the news in sports today. Good morning, Aaron. Yeah, good morning. Um, Leila, first of all, Tundu. Any point for Tundu on this one? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Nigeria is on the cusp of doing something great again. Um, some years ago, Nigeria actually took the world by storm. And let's tell you that the Nigerian Football Federation and sportswear giant Nike will, on the 5th of February, unveil the new Super Eagles jersey in New York ahead of the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations match day three home qualifiers encounter against Syria Lone. And let's say the Nike extended their deal in 2018 with the Nigeria Football Federation and are eager to design another set of jersey for the three-time African champion. Now, some years ago, before the World Cup, these were the scenes in Oxford Street in London where people came out in droves to queue for hours. They actually came as early as 6 a.m. The stores did not open till about 10 a.m. For everyone wanted to get a piece of a retro jersey, which was reminiscent of what Nigeria wore at the USA 94, um, and you had 94 World Cup, and it was quite phenomenal. Nike said they had not seen any kind of pre-orders like that for a jersey. As a matter of fact, they said there were 3 million pre-orders. As a matter of fact, if you put that side by side, they said in 2016, Manchester United had 2.6 pre-orders around the world. And for going into the World Cup in 2018, the Super Eagles jersey had 3 million pre-orders, and you look at that, it cost $19 for that, people secured. As a matter of fact, it's been resold on eBay because Nike has refused to restock these jerseys as much as $400, mm -hmm. and people are still buying it. It's the best jersey Amazing. ever. Well, it is. Honestly. Well, Aaron, I don't share either your enthusiasm or the enthusiasm of the Nigeria Football Federation, mm -hmm. and specifically Amadou Pinnock. Um, we don't go to uh, sporting competitions to go and uh, display Jesse. Because it, <laughs> no, because no, no, no. We didn't win. We didn't win the World Cup see, in 2018. We left the World Cup. We left the World Cup on the basis of our achievement with a uniform with Jesse with Ashley. Oh, yes, so this is a Nigerian tab. <laughs> now this Nike. Yeah. We're told that February 5, new jerseys yeah. will be unveiled for Nigeria. Yeah. So are we going to the 2022 World Cup also to go and display jerseys or to work hard towards that uh, you know, uh, event to be able to win the World Cup and impress the world with the artistry and technical it's capability all a part of, the of brand. our team. is not interested in style or Honestly, Number two, if you look at this jersey that they want to unveil on February 5, it's yeah. going to be in New York. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we start in Nigeria? Because Amadou Pinnock in the story says, okay, it will first be unveiled in New York then, and then in London, London then and then Nigeria will come last. Is it the people of New York that are going to wear the jersey? I, I, if the jersey is meant yeah. for the yeah, super eagles, come and unveil yeah, it first in yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. I, I think in terms of the planning and the negotiation, you know, uh, the NFF is not thanking Nigeria. The same they way are we thinking going. of an opportunity to go to New York mm. and go to uh, London. 
Number three, Nike <laughs> was started in 1964 mm -hmm. by Phil Knight and uh, his coach, yes. uh, Bowerman, yeah. at the University of Oregon. These yeah. were Americans who started it, and then they built it up. Now, we have, so many years after independence, we have designers, we have talented people in Nigeria here who can design Jesse. Why is the NFF, you know, the Football Federation, not using Nigerian designers? We can go for all I care to the World Cup mm -hmm. in uh, Adire Jesse. No, but no, no, no. If, if we win the World yeah. Cup, the Jesse will not matter. Doctor, the point is this. Uh, uh, the point is, I don't think any Nigerian brand, when they actually signed this deal, because Adidas pulled out of the deal um, going into 20, uh, just after 2014 because of the fractures and the imports at the Glass House, and Nike shelled out $3.7 million for this particular right to actually kit Nigeria for the next five years. And um, there were still added bonuses if Nigeria qualified for the 2018 World Cup, which she did. And also, let's see how things will play out if Nigeria qualifies for the 2022 World Cup. I don't think any Nigerian brand, any Nigerian sportswear brand, will be able to shell out $3.75 million to the Nigeria Football Federation. So monetary wise Did anybody wise, give them the opportunity? Yes, they did, because as a matter of fact, yes. I, I could they remember... They can be encouraged. They can be encouraged. No, they can be encouraged. Money. No, they can be encouraged, but I could remember Ahmad Jupinik showing his frustration before they actually landed the contract because he said that he was literally shopping, cap in hand, to sponsors. He went to Under Armour, went to wrote to several people, and nobody was willing to even work with Nigeria. And at the same time, yeah. don't forget, Nike are also known, especially in the last two years, for a lot of work that they've been doing globally for black athletes. It's a thing that they've become known for now. Yeah. They're doing a lot of work, so, and they branded themselves in the past two years around supporting black athletes. So I think a lot of this, I think the narrative is also about the fact that they want to show their support to African athletes, right? So it's a double-edged sword here, because I understand what Doctor is saying as well. I don't think it's right that it's being launched or unveiled in New York to begin with. Exactly, because I don't think there really is any rationale. You know, I feel like it should be in Lagos first or in Abuja, but I say Lagos because it's a more commercial hub, right? At the end of the day, they came last year. They brought the jerseys in. A lot of celebrities. We showed the pictures on screen a second ago of all the celebrities that were there wearing the jerseys. People came in. I can't remember the name of the event. It happened over Easter, right? Something of a bigger scale like that to unveil should have been done here and not in New York. So that is quite problematic. But as a matter of fact, thanks to Nike to, for coming back and doing their jerseys. It's Oregon, again, like you mentioned, opinion. where um, Nike headquarters is. Act Nike Portland, actually headquarters. Portland, Portland, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think Beverman, Oregon, that's where they actually housed. If they did it there, I'd have understood that they're going to Nike headquarters. But in New York. I don't get that. Uh, nobody gets that. Mm. Uh, okay, for, for the, the same way. I'm so sorry. It's the same way we're going to launch Nigerian Airlines or uh, Nigerian Airways in London now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Honestly. Yeah. Okay, so in the bit actually that. moving on. Um, a very, very, a very, very pitiful scene and a very, very distasteful scene actually happened yesterday night into this morning. Um, that's we actually learned that the report actually had it that a Manchester United executive talking about Ed Woodward had his house vandalized and there was a vile innovate, I mean, invasion into his house in the Cheshire region of the United Kingdom. It was really sad. The good thing was that no one was home when this particular issue actually happened because he has a wife and two twin daughters who were not home, thankfully so. The men, they call them hooligans, some ultras of Manchester United who are called men in black invaded them. Some, some reports have it that 20 of them, some said 30 of them, but the point have it that at least 20 people were there with flares and if, we, if they can actually help us with these pictures, really, really sad with flares going at the Manchester United um, um, executive's house, claiming that so much has been spent in the last years and Manchester United has fallen from grace to grass. And they say he earns four million pounds a year. He's not been able to bring in so much that he's been a business executive for Manchester United as against a sporting executive for them because he left JP Morgan to join Manchester United. And they said that he has no business, no sports mind in business. That's well, what so we're doing with so what we're doing with yeah, is this one is... violence yeah. yes. uh, off the pitch. We have spent um, so much time on this program complaining yeah. about violence mm. or racism, uh, you know, at uh, football events. But now we've seen an indication of violence uh, of the pitch with this attack yeah. on the de facto boss of uh, Manchester United. Yeah. I think it's condemnable. 
we've been told that uh, the uh, persons, if they can be identified, will be arrested and be subjected to prosecution. Mm -hmm. Two, it's also about a phenomenon of, uh, you know, the fan club. Um, you know, they're frustrated. Manchester United, that used to be under Alex Ferguson, the star team, you know, the team of uh, David Beckham, of Wayne Rooney, of yeah. all the superstars, has suddenly become, uh, you know, a sluggish uh, presence on the Premier League table. I think they have 36 points with 14 matches to go. They don't stand a chance. And they are behind Manchester City. Well, they are behind Leicester City. Team. They are even behind Chelsea. Look at how young you our know, team is. That, like, give and Man then, some mercy. And, and then again, um, you know, the fans are also not, as you have pointed out, satisfied with the management. Yeah. But do you know that, uh, do you think that with the uh, buying of, uh, the purchase of uh, Bruno's uh, Fernandes, Fernandes. Mm. Uh, who is supposed to do his medicals today and maybe possibly uh, show up tomorrow, do you think that will make any difference? Now, the point is this. Leila was about to mention things will only get worse for Manchester United, as a matter of fact, because they play <laughs> Manchester City tonight. And they are the... Okay, yeah, but well, I'm talking French... about this season. Of course we're going to have a terrible season. No, but it's been it's, a terrible no, season. It's, well, it's, it's, been a, yeah. it's, a, it's been a terrible last six, seven years. Ever since Alex Ferguson hung up his boots and said he was not going to be coaching the club. He wanted to retire. Manchester United have been on a free fall. And a very devastating one knows that. So you're trying to tell me that time in your opinion, and time things and time won't again. get better over time. It's not looking. So that's why they are complaining. Because of course, Manchester United has spent well over yes. a billion buying players yes. since 2013 till date. In any business, then somebody should be fired. When you spend over a billion, yeah. and you have nothing to show for it. I, that, like you I said, agree with you. People understand the frustration of the fans, but not taking it from the pitch to the domestic environment, whereby it's you awful. go to a man's house and try terrible. to attack him. Because they said they ran the intercom, nobody, nobody was home, so nobody answered, and they decided to start throwing it's flare terrible. bombs into the house and trying to throw pellets in the house, basically, and. It's really sad what we've seen, but I'm just saying that it's only going to get worse tonight. Well, see you tonight. Yes, okay. Thank <laughs> we'll you, it. Always a pleasure. <laughs>